sorry about that a little delay. Uh, first of all, it's an uh, honor and a pleasure to have this podium after Alex Miller, uh, my mentor from previous years. Uh, you heard my, what I said before. Uh, Professor Miller actually knew me uh, when I was a pro uh, uh, postdoc. Uh, many, uh, how many years ago, I don't want to say, but he uh, uh, perfected me, invited me, and was very important in my career. Having said that, this is a perfect time to talk because I'm going to talk on the TJ and the Hubbard Fund. <laughs> no, I was actually going to talk about something else, but after your talk, I decided to give a little, tell you a little bit more about the TJ Fund. Uh, and can you hear me now? So, uh, actually, I come from a different community than yours. I come from statistical mechanics. I still, I'm a president of Southern University, but I still teach every semester and I still publish. Uh, because we like doing this, we like uh, multitasking. Uh, actually, in statistical mechanics, what we like to do is we, we try to solve models. We try to solve important, difficult models, and one of these, mo some of these models are electronic models. Now, if honestly, if I have to make an admissions to you, we solve these models, we uh, publish them, and if it has some relevance to real life experiments, as it had in my career since I came all the way up here from. We're also very happy. Having said that, I'm going to present you some solutions of what we've done with my graduate students, which I have trained in Turkey since coming back to Turkey 12 years ago after 32 years in the United States. Uh, so basically, what we've done is I'm going to start with the solution of a Falcon Kimball model, with a, which is an electronic model. We have a phase diagram approach. We use renormalization group theory. But after that, we are going to have time to move on to the TJ model, the Hubbard model spatial isotropy, uh, frustration, and non-magnetic impurities in computers. Uh, basically, the spinless uh, uh, Kimball model is a model which at each side, there are two types of Hamiltonians, bound Hamiltonians, and mobile Hamiltonians. If we write the phase diagram here, this is, there's just, it's very, it's a simplistic model, very simple, minimalist model. There's an on-site interaction, notice that there's a minus beta in front of my Hamiltonian, there's an on-site interaction between the number operator of the uh, electrons which are attached, which may be, uh, which do not hop on each side, and these are the mobile electrons. So these are operators which are either zero and one, zero and one. This is the mobility of the electrons and electrons, the mobile electrons, and there's a chemical potential here that controls both the mobile electrons and the on-site. Uh, basically, we have uh, done a solution of this using the normalization group theory, an approximate solution. And the way you do this is you cannot solve this exactly, and there are two difficulties for this. One of them is quantum mechanics, and the other one is the fact that this is high dimensionality. This is not, it's above one dimension. And for each one of them, there are well tested approximations through the years. Uh, the first approximation that we're going to use is uh, for the quantum effect is uh, Suzuki Takana approximation and the dimensionality effect we're going to deal with the Mikhail Kadam approximation. The Suzuki Takana approximation was uh, uh, introduced many years ago, 1979, uh, uh, for quantum spin systems, and since then it has been extensively used in the normalization group theory for quantum systems. Uh, what happens is that let me just describe it to you for a chain. In a chain, I can write my Hamiltonian as nearest neighbor interactions. I can rewrite this as a I am the site I interacting with I minus one, I plus one, going from here to here, just the organization. Here, I do an approximation. I do something that we tell our graduate students you should never do. I take here the exponential of a sum, and I write it as a product of exponentials. Having done this, I can do the trace over a uh, site i and get a coupling of the Hamiltonian between site i minus one and i plus one. And then I do the reverse. I commit the reverse sin. I take this product of exponentials and I write it as an exponential of a sum. And then I have my renormalized system. So of course, these are both of them are violations. But in fact, what we're doing is we're taking into account the non-commutativity of the operators across three sites and then ignoring the rest. And we do this at each length scale. Uh, this, in principle, is uh, how can you, these are in opposite directions, so we hope there's some cancellation, but it's very hard, term by term, to prove that there's a cancellation. The fact is that the proof of the pudding is in the five, the fact that it works. 
if you look at that priori, this is like shooting someone in the chest and then lifting the person up and finding the bullet ball and shooting them in the reverse direction and hoping that the person is going to get up and walk. I don't recommend that you do that. But here it obviously works since we end up getting the results. Uh, I mean, first of course, you test this against well-known things like the uh, XY model, the Heidinger model, quantum spin systems. You get well-known <laughs> results and we have extended this so they find us. Now, with respect to uh, let alone the fact that it's a quantum mechanical model, the fact that it's high dimension makes it uninstallable. For that, we use the most commonly used, the most successful approximation of the normalization group theory, which is the Mindal Kavanaugh approximation. How does that work? We work, we work on a cubic lattice. Here's a cubic lattice. It's insoluble because it's highly connected. What you do is you eliminate, you cut some of the bonds. For example, I cut the bond here, I cut the bond here, I eliminate these bonds. But doing that, you weaken the uh, connectivity of the lattice. So, so for every bond that you cut, you add another bond. So you get something, of course, it's an infinite lattice. You get something that looks like a gooey Turkish dessert, which I recommend you eat. But what we do here now, we're ready to sum over, do my trace over these sites, and that can get my denormalized system. Now, you can say, how, why does this work? This is an example that you have in physics of physically realizable approximations. In fact, the fact that all this butchering works is that this method is approximate for the cubic lattice, but it's exact on another lattice that you can create, and that other lattice is a hierarchical lattice. I start with a bond, replace it with a graph. Every bond here I replace with a graph at infinitum, perfectly well-defined lattice. And this denormalization group of transformation is exact on this lattice. Years ago when we found this, we were making a lot of apologies, saying that, well, look at this, I'm sorry, uh, this is an uh, unusual lattice. But nowadays, it, was, it, it, it turns out that these hierarchical lattices are the basis of scale-free networks, which are, of course, for social systems, other information networks are the basic uh, 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 lattices. So having said this, now I continue with our calculations. Now, the way you do uh, the crux of the approximation here is doing the trace here, which is quite hard, going from here to summing over these for a quantum mechanical system. And you look here, here it is again. Uh, what you have here is a, a is a, a three-site operator, you're going to reduce it to a two-site operator, so you're taking a 64 by 64 system, uh, uh, here there are 64 possible states uh, on each side, on the side here, and you're reducing it to a 16 by 16 matrix. The way you deal with that is that you block diagonalize using a new basis set, which, are, which block diagonalize these uh, uh, three-side and two-side operators, and there are the eigenvectors of the number operators here and of the par parity operators. I just gave you one example for the two-side basis set, the three-side basis set, there's another, side. these are the size here, and the phi's are also there. Just to give you a feeling of how this works. Once you block diagonalize this, you can, the biggest block that you have are four by four blocks, and you can numerically do the transformation. And in fact, as in uh, most renormalization group theories, you don't end up with the Hamiltonian you started with. You end up with, in our original Hamiltonian, we have four interaction constants. In our new Hamiltonian, we have five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, not counting the additive constants. So you go into a space where there are 12 interaction constants in the Hamiltonian, but the good news is that after you do transformation again, this doesn't change. The numerical values here changes, and you follow these, and from that, you can derive all the equilibrium properties of the system. So in fact, here, these are just to again give you an example of how this thing works. These are the recursion relations. These are matrix elements. And the normalized interactions are given as ratios of matrix elements. You end up, and then you look at uh, the eigenvectors of the recursion matrix, which gives you the expectation values of the operators in Hamiltonian. You calculate this at each normalization group trajectory. You find the sinks of these flows, the completely stable fixed points, these gives you the thermodynamic phases. The basings of attraction of each sink gives you the global phase diagram, and the eigenvalues at each fixed point of the phase boundary gives you the tra phase transition properties, whether these are first order or second order phase transition, and also if they're second order phase transition, the critical response. So we've done this, uh, my student, Ozan Saria, this is part of my, my co-author, work was published because it was in the first transparency uh, last November. Ozan Salier and I is a postdoc at the 
University of North Carolina after getting his PhD with me here. So now, what I'm moving to the results. So I'm going to give you a global phase diagram, a set of phase diagrams coming up uh, for, for various uh, values of the interaction constants. Remember that if you go back quickly for Hamiltonian, uh, T is the hopping parameter which makes which couples the site. This is the on site interaction. These are the chemical potentials of the two types of electrons. So the coupling between the sites comes from the hopping property. Uh, so first, so that, uh, obviously for T equals zero, the model is soluble. The normalization group theory gives you disordered phases. The first capital D means dense, small d means dilute. The first is for the bound Hamiltonians, the second one is the mobile Hamiltonians. They're regions with smooth transitions between them. So these are like supercritical lines. There is no phase transition going from here to here. And all my phase diagrams are going to be in chemical potential, localized electron chemical potential, conduction electron chemical potential. And here I like the same phase diagram in conduction electron density, localized electron density. So T0 is the decoupled system. Now I start increasing. So basically, when I start to get to the values of T, scale to the on-site uh, interaction, uh, small and large here for a given on-site coupling constant, which is minus 0.1 repulsive coupling constant. For small t, again, there are no phase transitions, for, but for high t, we find from our calculation that there are charge order phases. So there are, here, this, in my, in my notation, dashed lines means there's no phase transition right here, full lines means second order critical phase transitions. So th there are uh, four types of charge order phases, this is the uh, uh, localized electron dense, conduction electron dilute, localized di di dense, conduction dense, localized dilute, conduction dilute, and here, localized dilute, conduction dense. And what is, what is the charge order phase? The charge order phase of the cubic lattice forms two sublattices. There is the electron dense, these are different on each sublattice. There's more density on one sublattice and in, than in the other. So it's the equivalent of an antiferromagnetic ordering that you see here for this electron system. We can, again, as I said, we can calculate everything about the, all the equilibrium properties of this. And if you look here, this, you can zoom in to here. Zoom in here, you find that interesting from us critical phenomena persons, there six second order lines coming, meeting at a special point here, right? Uh, things get more interesting as we go on. Uh, this is uh, how do I, uh, so we're basically going in a three-dimensional global phase diagram space. In here, this was a weak electron-electron interaction on site. This is a stronger electron-electron interaction. And small value of the hopping, large value of the hopping, first order phase boundaries happen, uh, occur bounded by critical. The equivalent density density diagrams are here. So the first order phase boundaries open occur in coexistence regions. And here are charge order uh, phases right here. And this is first order. So now, in the previous diagram, as you can see, the charge ordered phases occur at the around half filling 0.5 of the conduction electron density. And for the whole range of uh, localized electron densities, uh, here, that still continues, but coexistence, phase coexistence occurs around half filling of both conduction electron density and localized electron density. For example, right here, there is a dense and, and dilute co the disordered phase coexistences. Here, there's a quadruple point where all four disordered phases coexist. In here, in the central region, there's a coexistence of the charge ordered phases and of the dilute phases, if you zoom into here, you see this kind of insect squash, insect like of structure in which there are critical endpoints, critical lines, and here, and in between in this regions, for example, there are two different charge order phases that coexist. In this side region here, there is a dilute and charge order phase that coexists. Now, if I go further now to higher, phase, okay, one point is that if you do a global phase diagram, the rule is that every the phase diagram should change gradually. So you should be able to get all the intermediate phase diagrams between two different phase diagrams, one thing at a time changing. So in, uh, this was bad news for my student Ozan Sariak as he was doing his PhD, because in, I cannot looking at this see how from this phase diagram you go to this one. 
So in between there are about five different phase diagrams, and I'm going to, of course, hold on, I have to find them here. This is starting from here, going all the way to the other side. In chemical potential, in electron densities, I'm not going to bore you with them all, but if at each phase diagram going from here to here, there's one event that I've changed. For example, right here, for the first time, to my knowledge, in such normalization group studies, there are three phase coexistence between three different uh, disordered phases. You move in here, and there's two phase coexistence. Eventually, you get into a phase diagram that's topologically identical to what I showed before. And then, finally, in, this, in these phase diagrams, you go to high levels of the on-site interactions, and continuing from here, all the second order lines that end at endpoints. The endpoints pass through each other as you increase the hopping constant. You get here, basically, these lines of charge order phases, finger-like uh, uh, regions, and here the other ones. This is chemical potential. When you do calculation in the uh, density phase, this is the density density phase diagram that you get. So what you see is here coexistence regions that have spread over all density regions essentially. And actually this shape is real. If you look at this maximum here, this maximum in the chemical potential phase diagram corresponds to the minimum of this coexistence region here. In fact, we looked over, and this reminds me of a chimera, chimera phase diagram. A uh, chimera is, a, is an ugly fish here. It really exists in nature, and it really looks like this. So this is a good way to remember this. So in fact, this was to prove to you the power of this method, and how you get actually, uh, fair, just through hopping, uh, you get a ordered phase, a charge ordered phase, distinction between sublattices, and that's due to the hopping of the electrons. Basically, it's the equivalent of re level repulsion in, in atomic physics. The, uh, the charge order states have many more connections to more excited states. So when you do second order perturbation theory, that pushes them further down than other states. So that's why you get, for example, these charge order phases. That's why you get anti-ferromagnetism in the Hubbard model, although there's no direct uh, 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 spin spin and hyperomagnetic interaction. So, since I have much more time, and since it was mentioned before, I will move on to talk to you about TJ and Hubble Moss. So, again, as I say, from a, from a person like myself, I mean, who has spent the last uh, close to half a century or so uh, doing uh, solving statistical mechanics model, doing phase transition and critical phenomena, a tough model, a model that nobody else has solved yet is a good thing to attack, and that's what we've been doing for a while with my graduate students. So I'm going to give you an overview of using the same model, the, uh, method, the Suzuki Takano, uh, Takano method for uh, quantum mechanics, and the Mikhail Kadnoff model uh, for the higher dimensionality, and the results we get for the TJ model, Hubble model, same model, the TJ model, spatial anisotropy, we probably won't have to. This is important, the last one, the, final, the model, with modeling basically adding non-magnetic zinc impurities into the DJ model. And this was done by, by a series of my graduate students here, starting with Michael Njewski. Michael Njewski is my last graduate. I, I was a faculty member at MIT, as you Brian Bay said, for 25 years. Michael Njewski is my last graduate student my, from MIT and my first Turkish graduate student. You can ask how can Michael Njewski be Turkish graduate student, that I can answer the questions. And the other ones are students that Nadia Kaplan was on study at our students that I trained here. Uh, so going here, actually this goes back to be a, a, a while. In 1995, with my graduate student at, uh, my, my doctoral student at MIT, Alexis Falikov, we solved the TJ model using these approximations. So here is a, the electron density versus temperature, and Alexis Falikov, we all know, one of our elder statespersons, Way. Uh, Leo Falikov, another mentor and friend of mine, and Alexis Falikov is his son. Uh, so it was great to use, uh, to solve Leo Falikov's model, a model using a method that Alexis Salk uh, and I invented, basically. And in fact, after getting his PhD from MIT, Alexis went on to medical school. He is an MD, PhD now in Seattle. So here, what we found, uh, using these approximations and solving the TJ model, the TJ model allows one of these are projection operators that eliminate sites which have two electrons. So at most, there's one electron per site. 
There is a hopping term. There is a site as spin spin interaction and electromagnetic interaction. There is a number number interaction and a chemical potential. So no adjustable parameters. We follow our nose. We do the approximate calculation, and this is what we got with Alexis in 1995. There is here an antiferromagnetic phase. Uh, that, that, and the antiferromagnetic phase is unstable to about 7% uh, cold doping. Uh, and right here, around 30% uh, and 40%, between 30% and 40% cold doping, we have, these are coexistence regions, and this is disorder. We have islands of antiferromagnetism, but we have a new phase, tau phase, which we call, go past our TJ model referees, uh, well, it's a, a tau phase which has been not, had never been seen in other classical models. What is the tau phase? Everywhere else on the renormalization group, the hopping constant T, the hopping strength, renormalizes to zero. So asymptotically, T goes to zero. Right here, T, the hopping the, the strength here, renormalizes to infinity. Another thing is, everywhere else, as it is in all renormalization you know, theories of lattice systems, the chemical potential everywhere else, we normalize either to zero or to, uh, to minus infinity or plus infinity. So the lattice either completely empties of electrons or completely fills with electrons. So asymptotically, there is no room for conversion. Right here in the tau phase, it renormalizes, it basically mu does not renormalize to infinity. And asymptotically, the lattice has about 66% has about electrons, 34% holes, not two thirds on the edge. So here is an infinite hopping strength and a lattice with about one third holes and two thirds electrons. So, I mean, if it uh, looks like a dog, the duck walks like a uh, dog, quacks like a dog, it is maybe suitable. So, they having said that, we had. Uh, our biggest indication was that this was really, and it also occurring in the dome region of the uh, of the superconductors. Uh, maybe by coincidence, maybe not. At least from the calculation, the TJ model showed this superconducting looking phase. Right here. Now, the next thing we calculate, of course, it's very hard to get things that accepted, especially if you come from a different community using different approximations, getting uh, having different interpretations to the results. So the next thing that we did with my student, uh, last MIT first Turkish student, Mike Lindsay in 2008, is to look at impurities. So basically, consider adding zinc impurities. This is a coin random problem. Randomly, we add these impurities into the, si into the system. Electrons cannot go. And we have a how do we do this in our uh, uh, theoretical formalism? We put the random chemical potential. The chemical potential at the impurity side for the electron is minus infinity. It's zero when there is no impurity. So the, the impurity chemical potential, there's also an electron chemical potential. So this is an added term here. And then we do renormalization group here. The problem gets infinitely harder because after one renormalization group transformation, uh, all of these uh, coupling constants themselves become quenchrand frozen random. So basically, you have to look at the distrib quench probability distribution function, a function of all these interactions, and basically look at the evolution of this underscale transformation. So before, where you were doing one renormalization group transformation, you have to do, literally do 300,000 renormalization group transformations to numerically map one function to the other, and basically look at the flow in functions of this. But my just did this. Uh, and uh, did very well. So he is now, in fact, he did get his PhD from me, uh, an MIT PhD, but working in Turkey, and now he's a postdoc at the University of Maryland. Uh, so I'm going to, so basically, there's a convolution here of the quenchless uh, probability distributions, which you, you look under the flow, you look at how this goes under scale transformation. So I'm going to basically uh, skip to the results here the method you've seen. You've seen the phase diagram. So this is 1%, 2%, 3%, 4% zinc. At 5% zinc, what we call the superconducting phase here, in the, the dome here, completely disappears. Now, this is quite strange, the fact that you have 5% impurities and a phase disappears. Because as we know, this is a cubic lattice, a simple cubic lattice. The percolation threshold for a simple cubic lattice is 78%. This is what we work so basically, you need 78% impurities before, you, uh, 
before destroy, destroying a classical phase on that cubic glass. Here, uh, this phase, this uh, would be superconducting phase, is so fragile that it disappears at 5% impurity. And I should also add that this is a, I mean, this is an approximate end theory, but there's no adjustable parameters. Basically, once you do the Suzuki Takana uh, thing with the commutation relations, and you do Mingdal Karna for the dimensionality, you just follow your norm. There's nothing to adjust, you have no degree of freedom to adjust. And here, there is no way in a phase transition and critical phenomena paper we could have gotten this published with the phase disappearing at 5% impurity. But we find that in experimenters had found in the cup rates that the, basically uh, the, uh, the superconducting phase disappears between 2 and 6% uh, impurities, uh, non magnetic impurities. And lo and behold, we find that. And the fact that it changed between 2 and 6 is obviously a material thing, but at 5% is Let's move to the next result. In the next result, we look here, we have this anti-ferromagnetic phase. The anti-ferromagnetic, you add impurities, and the anti-ferromagnetic phase in the beginning increases. This is something unheard of in classical systems. It's as if on a Monday morning, you're in Istanbul, you're right here in, nice, in the nice corners of Istanbul, with all of us, especially if you're a uh, university president with three different campus sites in Istanbul, and you have to take, go to all three of them, on a Monday morning, traffic is uh, quite a challenge, as, as much as a challenge as the DJ model. But it's as if you have a Monday morning traffic in Istanbul, in a very random crossing, there's an accident, traffic comes to a stop, and because of that, traffic flows back. It's unheard of. Classically, here, I'm, I'm looking, I'm taking the system, I'm putting quench impurities, random impurities, and here is this ordered phase, and the ordered phase increases. And of course, there was no way my colleagues in phase transition would have uh, allowed the publication of this. But again, experimentalists have seen an anti-ferromagnetic enhancement with the inclusion of non-magnetic impurities. So this, again, is uh, something that made us happy. Uh, and uh, another thing that you see here is that how does this, the, how does this here, if we go back actually, the comments um, this is enhancement of away from half billion from small p. Again, as I said in my comments before, they refer to this slide, you see it, anti-ferromagnetic enhancement. And my final comment is if you look at the anti-ferromagnetic phase, with impurities that also disappears, but it disappears at 40%. This line here, you can see, it goes away to zero at 40% impurities. Now, 40% is still much less than 78%, but then again, these two phases are very similar phases. The tau phase that we find here, the would-be superconductor and then hypermagnetic phase, they're due to the electron exchange uh, uh, integral uh, potential. And one of them uh, disappears at 6%, the other one disappears at 40%. Again, this is quite unusual. They have never gotten published unless the experimentals have not found something similar. So this, of course, made us quite happy. Uh, the TJ model that I've shown you here, we can deal with it putting non-magnetic impurities because it's a simplified model. A much tougher model, what the TJ model comes from, is the Hubbard model. In that we have applied our method to the Hubbard model as well, not yet with impurities. But if you look at in the Hubbard model, the up operator here does not occur around. So at each electron side, you can have no electrons, up electrons, down electrons, or paired electrons. And there's an on-site interaction. And having applied, again, I'm not going to go through our method, the exact same method. There's, this is with Michael and Jeske, chemical potential versus temperature for strong coupling, weak coupling. I'm going to show the same phase diagrams for uh, in a, a density space. You cannot see it very well. This electron density versus temperature, strong coupling, uh, and weaker coupling here. At half filling, we see an antiferromagnetic phase. The antiferromagnetic phase is unstable to doping of either whole or electron doping of about 10%. And around the antiferromagnetic phase, right next to the antiferromagnetic phase and further up, there are two different tau phases. Tau phases are the phases that we find in which the copper electron hopping strength renormalizes infinity and the lattice still has both and electrons to do production. 
basically. We find two different, uh, this is a much larger calculation, but these two phases, tau, uh, tau Tj, because it also occurred in the Tj model, and tau Hb, tau Hubbard, because it only occurs in the uh, Hubbard model, are distinct from each other. There's no way of going into a multi-dimensional Hamiltonian space and connecting this one from another one. They have different fixed ones. And what we found in the two of them is that, we, as I said, we can calculate everything. We can calculate specific heat, anything that you want, equilibrium properties. If you look at the tau Pj, and here I'm, uh, I'm plotting gamma, specific heat over temperature, you see that at low temperatures, the specific heat in tau Pj is linear. Uh, here, it's exponential for tau Hubbard at low temperatures. If I look at the critical phenomena here, here the critical exponent alpha is minus 1, very close to uh, minus 0 0.97, very close to uh, Bose-Einstein minus 1. Right here, there is actually singularity if you blow up, and there the critical exponent alpha is minus 2.7, not as small, but still much different than here, close to the 3 dxy model. And specific heat, exponential specific heat, can be fit very well to a function like this. So we see here a VCS-like behavior in one of the so-called superconducting phases, and we see VEC-like behavior in the other one. Both of them occur in our calculation of the upper bar. If I continue here, I'm going to skip the, uh, this, this is for anisotropic systems. So uh, going quickly from a uh, complete isotropic system, uh, making it weaker, the couplings in the z direction weaker by 70%, uh, 50% in here. If you go to, and, uh, and here the scale is 15 times larger than the rest, so this would not be seen if I had the same scale here. We see the phase transitions disappearing, but first the uh, superconducting phase is disappearing as we go to an anisotropic system. So here, again, I said you can calculate everything for the anisotropic equals 50J model. Here's for different anisotropies, 10%, 30%, 50%, 70%, 100%. This is the phase diagram. And along this line, I show you calculations. Chemical potential is a function of density. Uh, here, kinetic energy along here, the in the xy plane along the z direction is a function of density. Spin, spin polar direction in the xy plane or along the z direction is a function of density. In one of them, I want to concentrate to chemical potential as a function of electron density. And here is again a calculation, no adjusted parameters. This is whole concentration versus chemical potential shift. And we sh this is, there's data here and here, the graph is that bigger. These are at various temperatures, uh, temperature getting low here, are calculated they, uh, curves and experimental data. There's a scatter, but there's clearly the experiments here, experiments here, and experiments here. So there is a figment of uh, a connection here, notwithstanding that we really work on these because we lack these models. But there, there is also, I think, connection with uh, solid state systems. Uh, and you get, uh, when you put frustration into these systems, you get many more phase diagrams. I'm going to uh, skip that actually and come uh, to the end. Uh, in here, these are my students, and uh, my students uh, here, this is in the, we always go to the APS meetings, but the, the 2009 APS meeting, for the first time in many years, I did not go because something happened to me. Presidency happened to me, so that I was in preparation there, but I did send my whole group here. Uh, on the way, they stopped at Frank Temple's uh, uh, Central Park to say hello to Humboldt and uh, send me this picture. Michael and Jesse is here. Nadia Patron, whose work on trust phases and what there, which I've shown, was there. And here, uh, this is Ozan Salia. Uh, uh, we have, a, as I said, I come from the statistical mechanics community, so we have our uh, bi monthly, uh, biannual meetings with Joel Lobovitz at Rutgers University, and this is May 2010. Ozan Salia talking on yet another. Of course, at uh, Savant University, we have many different faculties, many different projects, and I put zinc inside of superconducting systems. But my colleague, Ismail Chakmat, put zinc inside of wheat uh, to feed the world better. So I think that I uh, just wanted to mention that. And of course, this comes from beautiful Istanbul, who you, have seen, you will have a chance to see. And from our Savant University, which uh, has a physics-friendly uh, 
president. I would welcome all of you for a visit at my university. I get along well with the president. I should see the psychologist, but I didn't. So thank you very much. And I think I made up for our delay. And I have, of course, I will take that question. Thank you. We thank Professor Becker for his speech and his presentation. Now, by standing here, I can see everybody. If I stand in the light, I can't see anyone. So if, if the time is late, I'm going to go there, not to be able to see the um, re re requests for questions. A anybody who wants to ask a question. Old friend, Yuji. Hi. Um, Can you elaborate a little bit on the physical nature of the Tao things? Well, uh, of course, you had, had a, as usual, you put a fine point there. In our calculations, I calculate the equilibrium statistical mechanic problem. So the things that I know is that it's a distinct phase. There's a second order phase boundary around the one. The fact that if you look at its fixed point, t, the hopping constant, we know rises to infinity. And if I also look at that asymptotically, it has about one third holes, two thirds electrons. Those are all the things that I can say. More things that I can say, there's one thing here, uh, in here. It is, uh, if you look at the, uh, correlation fun uh, the correlation functions, the singlet correlations are important, the triplets are not. Uh, beyond that, uh, coming from our methods, at this stage there's not much more that I can say. I wish I could. Okay. Now, Alex. Well, I think I'm not going to repeat what I said before about the TJ model. <laughs> However, uh, we see your model, many face diagrams you showed. And there are some where, uh, some where you have simultaneously two or three phases. Have you any indications of fractal behavior in the, in the simultaneously present? That, that, that's also a, a very good question. Let me go back to the simplest one for the DJ model here. Now, in here, uh, there, there is this tau phase here. Around there, there are these anti-ferromagnetic phases. But if I, uh, maybe this is what, the coastal I can count to fractal or scales. And if I blow this up, what you will see is that there are lines of anti-ferromagnetic phases in between lines of this order. If I look at any one of them and I blow up, I see that again at every temperature. Now, I have an, we have an idea on that, but it's just an idea. The fact is that maybe here there's an incommensurate spin order phase. And because we do an approximation and we have a definite length scale, it's like putting a basically substrate potential to an incommensurate spin order phases, and that's why it separates. So that's the closest thing I can come to fractal or scale free behavior. Okay, any any more questions? Yes, there is one there. Yeah, please. In most of your phase diagrams, you have these bubbles of antiferromagnetic phase, so called triangular, uh, one could say, uh, antiferromagnetic like, like phase. This phase diagram. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is usually very rare in mm -hmm. nature. So, do you consider this is a real effect or it's just a consequence of the approximations? Well, uh, I mean, uh, it is. Of course, because it's rare when it's found, the entrances go over them uh, quite often. I mean, it was first publicized in liquid crystals, uh, re entrant uh, pneumatic phases. And in fact, in our work, so once you get re entrance, you ask a question that you should ask. Why does it occur? You should be able to explain it with your fingers, you know, kind of intuitively. Because we know, you know, energy entropy, at low temperatures, the systems have to be ordered because entropy is not important. At high temperatures, they have to be dissolved. So when you have re entrance, you have to be able to explain it. For, so in the liquid crystals, when it was discovered, 
finally we were able to explain in terms of frustration, triplets, basically positional and spin order competing with each other. Uh, glasses. Spring glasses are reentrant, not quite reentrant really, but you go from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic to spin glasses. You lose non-ferromagnetic order as reentrant. That's, that's still a calculation result. Again, we found that ourselves calculation, but I have no way of explaining that using my fingers. Why does ferromagnetic order go away? Maybe I will, maybe I won't. So having prepared you like that, here uh, there, I have no intuitive way of explaining it, like I, I could do it for liquid crystals uh, easily. There is no intuitive way of explaining it. So it could be a figment of the approximation. It could not. Uh, even if it's a figment of the approximation, the calculation indicates that here at least it can be strong short range antiferromagnetic correlations, very close to the superconductor. I, may, I wish maybe someday I will have a way of finger waving about the entrance here. Yes. The value when I am from India, the value when it moves from GT to the system, GT is a magnetic and it goes to the plane side. And uh, is it necessary that uh, antiferromagnetic is necessary for superconductor? Uh, is it necessary that uh, antiferromagnetic battery is necessary for superconducting phase? Uh, I mean, they occur, in, at least in our calculations, they occur together. So we have never seen, to answer your question, it's a calculational answer. It's not, again, something that a priori you put in. That's the nature of this. Wherever we see this tau phase around it, we have seen antiferromagnetic, small regions of antiferromagnetism. Now, again, as my colleague from behind said, this could be a figment of the approximation, but in any case, it does indicate strong antiferromagnetic correlation. So it's, at least, they occur in parallel. I don't know, cause and consequence is hard to say. Any more questions? Good. Okay, now I'm going to present Dr. Um, Professor Berker with, with a play and a, um, Certificate for the attendance. Now, finally, it is coffee time, and it's now almost 11 o'clock.